Okay, it looks like it's being recorded. And we're just waiting for Lauren. And Tim, do you know how to um, move people from attendees to panelists and then back again? Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, I can do the promotion, right? Okay, great. All right, I will um, sign off and then let me know if anything happens and I can hop back on and troubleshoot. Uh, how do we get in touch with you in case there was... Uh, I just gave Maureen my phone number so she can okay, perfect. shoot me a text. Okay. Okay, bye-bye. Good luck. Hello. Hello. Hi, Lauren. Okay. Hi, I guess, are we? Yeah, we are all ready, ready for you. <laughs> um, Dave not here yet, is he? I guess he's coming. Dave Zomek. Um, Let me see if he's in the attendees. No, he's not. I I'll give a couple minutes and then okay, because I think we can do I can do my spiel that I have to do. Is the new health director coming? That's what I wondered too. I don't see anyone that appears to be the new health director. Um, I was hoping we could get to meet her. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, right. Do you see anyone in the attendees? It says eight participants. Hold on. Oh, that includes uh, panelists. There are three attendees. Do we know who they are? I guess that was the question. Uh, Jeremy Barker Plotkin is attending. He's from Simple Gifts Farm. Uh -huh. And then the other two names are Maura Keen and Risha Hess. Okay. All right. So they're not part of the people we're wondering about. Um, okay. Is is Risha the name that you mentioned as a new Risha, member? Yeah, Risha should. I didn't. That's that's our new board member. Okay. She's an attendee. So we should promote, I should promote to a panelist? I think so. We can t ask her a question. <laughs> okay. Let's see. If she's official. Is that Risha? It is. Uh, I am not official, so I would, I will not join. I have to do my swearing in and I'll. Okay. Probably, so next month I will be official, but it's All really. Right. We'll keep you as an attendee then. I'm yeah. glad to see you and uh, look forward to having you as an official board member. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's go ahead. and um, Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Maura Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to it access the meeting may do so by following the instruction on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings as soon as it is technologically possible. After this meeting, all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. I will now open this September 14th meeting of the Board of Health with a roll call. Uh, Premila? Couldn't hear you. Sorry, present. Uh, Lauren? 
Here. Tim? Here. And Maureen? Here. Okay. So our first item is to review the minutes from August 10th and make any corrections. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions about that or corrections to those minutes? No? I didn't see anything that I was concerned about. So do we have a motion to um, accept the minutes? Yes, I can make a motion to accept the August minutes. Okay. And a second. I can second. Okay. Um, and the vote. Um, Pramila? Aye. Lauren? Aye. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Aye. So the minutes are accepted. Um, and now we're going to go on. Is there any public comment? Anyone have their hand up or? No. I don't see it. I don't either. Um, uh, uh, David Zomek has his hands up. Oh, is he here? We should yeah, I, I, get him onto the panelists. One minute. Hello, David. Thank you Good for coming. Evening. Good evening, everybody. Okay. Yeah, Good evening. I just wondered, Maureen. Um, I am. I have multiple meetings tonight, and um, I actually have a meeting coming up at six p.m. And I wondered whether you might have room in your agenda for me to just update the the board on it, just a, a few quick things for you know all of five minutes, and then I will have to leave a, a few minutes before six. I think that would be fine if we move the director's update up uh, up to this yeah. time. Um, well, good. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for letting me squeeze in here. Um, hello, Ed. I I uh, see Ed every day, so it's great to see him on a, on a Zoom call here with you. Um, a couple of quick updates. I wanted uh, the board to be aware, first off, that Paul has appointed a new member to the Board of Health, and I uh, he did that on Monday night. Uh, Re um, let's see if I, uh, uh, Risha Hess, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to make sure you all knew about that. Um, I don't, go ahead, Maureen. Uh, we just met her. She's listening to this. Okay, wonderful. And But she's not, hasn't been sworn in yet. So she's not an official member of the board. Right. I Thank just you. wanted you to be aware and, and I'm sure she will get, uh, Risha will get sworn in um, soon. I wanted to let you know that. Um, of course, um, the big news from a staff standpoint is um, Paul um, has appointed our new health director, and I believe that Kyle sent all of uh, that information to you. On Monday night, uh, the town council did vote unanimously um, on that appointment. Um, I, did everyone get that information from Kyle? Um, yes. Our new... Um, Health director, public health director, uh, who goes by Kiko, will be joining us on uh, October second. So Kiko's first uh, day, official day in the office, will be October second. I had the pleasure of being part of that search process, and um, uh, am actually meeting with Kiko and staff in the health department next week informally. Um, but Kiko will start officially on October second. And I'm sure that um, I will work with uh, our HR department to make sure that um, there are, are meetings set up with you individually to, to sit down with Kiko and talk about some of the work you're doing, some of the work you will be looking at in the months ahead. And I'm sure that Kiko will also join you for your October um, meeting. So, so that's very exciting. Um, we will also uh, work with Kiko on uh, setting up appointments and uh, meet and greets with department heads, 
with community members, uh, with human service agencies, um, and I'm sure many others. Um, I will note that Kiko is currently working for the health department, the public health department in Northampton, so is very familiar with the region and is is uh, uh, not coming into this, um, you know, uh, without quite a bit of, of of history and understanding of the valley. So that's really exciting. Um, let's see what else. I am working with staff on setting up uh, flu clinics, and I'm sure that Kiko will take that over very shortly. For from me uh, to work with uh, uh, Kyle and Olivia and Nancy on that. Um, we're also waiting for the most recent, uh, the most updated information on COVID and COVID boosters. Um, I believe that information, you know, some of it has come out this week, but I expect more to come out next week. And we will learn from the state um, just how they will distribute um, the new booster and and you know how much of that we will actually get. Um, I think most of the focus, my understanding from what I've read and talked to people about, most of most of that focus will be on the most vulnerable members of our community, um, those uh, working with Craig's Doors, uh, homebound um, seniors, and others who cannot get to um, kind of those other places that we uh, many of us will be channeled to, like you know, uh, uh, retail pharmacies, et cetera. So um, I'm sure that staff and Kiko will have more information for you in the community uh, coming up. We're also trying to update the website. Um, we did just lose our our uh, communications director, Brianna Sunred, uh, left town service last week. So we're going to be playing a little catch up here with, with some of the um, updated information on the web, but we'll do the best we can there. Um, I think those were the major updates. Very exciting news about a new director. Um, I know that staff is very excited and, and the opportunities for collaboration within the Bangs Center, within the Senior Center, Bangs, Cress, uh, DEI, and other departments uh, with Kiko joining us is, is really going to be a, um, an exciting time. So. I think I'll stop there. If anyone has any quick questions, I don't want to take up too much of your agenda because I know you've had some um, ongoing um, agenda items you'd like to uh, work on and, and work through. I just wondered about the level of awareness around arboviruses. The towns around us have all come up to a more moderate risk uh, risk mm. level. We have not, and maybe we'll get through it, but I don't know um, if there are any there's any communication about that with the Pioneer Valley mosquito control or anything like that that's going yeah, on? Yeah, I've had a little, but I, honestly, I, I think I, I should focus on that a little bit next week. And and I, I may even um, tap Kiko for a little direction on that. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I, I, I understand that we have been kind of silent on that. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it has been um, something that we should focus on a little bit and, and at least get some information up on our website. So let me work with, with Kiko on that even before she arrives and see if I can get a little guidance on, on that. And we'll do some updating on our website and also um, kind of what messaging staff should be putting out there as well. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a need to put out any urgent information right now, but we it needs to be kind of ready to go, I guess, if if things change in the next few weeks. Yes, no, I appreciate that reminder. It has been something on, on my uh, uh, list of to-dos, so I appreciate that. So very excited to welcome a new new staff member and a new leader and uh, someone who I think is going to be very innovative and creative, and, and I think we'll all enjoy working with Kiko, so thank you. Thank you, Dave, for getting <laughs> giving us these updates. Does anyone else have any questions for David? No? All right, I guess we will move on then to um, our old business and starting with simple gifts. And, and I know we just got, I didn't even see it until I got on the website, uh, on the Zoom, because I 
been looking at the things all afternoon. I decided to take a break. And then, so there's a, a couple of new documents that came in and a report from Ed and, and a, a little sketch of the uh, actual facilities at, at um, mm -hmm. Simple Gifts Farm. So maybe Ed, you could just summarize that a little bit for us. Sure. I um, What I sent over was just uh, my notes essentially in letter form. And I did have a chance to review um, the notes with Jeremy and made a few modifications. So we were more in um, sort of in agreement about what I was going to put down. We had a um, what I would certainly characterize as a, a friendly uh, discussion of the situation that brought me up to speed and it even took me back to when the farm was starting and where the, the health department was at that time, because in 2017, um, when the proposal was made to build what we see today as Simple Gifts Farm Store, um, we were in a transition point where the health inspectors were transferring over to sit in the inspections department. And I think within a month or two of that transfer, the full-time health inspector uh, left for another position. And I was a shared inspector with Northampton, um, subsequently became a full-time inspector a few months later, um, but shared with the building department. So, you know, it came, the proposal came at a time when, you know, to be frank, it didn't get the review that we should have. And since then, the building department and health inspectors are much more coordinated about proposals, um, especially one I think that involved new construction, uh, ground up construction, we would be involved much earlier. And um, there was, I think, a basic misunderstanding about the type of operation that would be going in mm -hmm. um, and, and some difference in the way that um, perhaps health and building um, looked at um, a facility and the licensing for a facility. A farm stand has, and I, I think um, Susan may have gone over this earlier in notes, but a farm stand is basically a, um, an allowed business that's associated with a farm that generally sells whole uncut vegetables and fruits. And the proposal was for more than that, but you know, this was not something that that we picked up on. So mm -hmm. we're we're in a position today based partly, you know, that we created ourselves. Um, and at the time that the store did open with many more products, with refrigeration units, um, a compromise was worked out that continues to today. And that's to have a, um, there is a proper hand washing station available in a barn. It's about a 300 foot walk from the building to the barn. That barn houses a leafy greens production uh, area where greens from the farm are um, double or triple washed, I imagine, and uh, made for packaging for retail sale. And there's a full-fledged, permanently installed, uh, well-stocked with hot water hand wash station at that point. But there also was agreed to put a um, temporary or portable hand wash station in, right in front of the store, just outside the door. And um, Jeremy, Jeremy and I walked up to the uh, permanent hand wash station, then back down. Um, the staff each morning sets up a Cambro insulated beverage container or beverage dispenser, um, supplements the, the water in the, the Cambro with hot water uh, from an electric tea kettle inside, which is creative and effective. Um, the water is obtained from actually a yard hydrant, uh, which is installed just 10 feet or so out the front door of the store. So the water is convenient. Um, I did talk with the plumbing and gas inspector for the town, and he said his only question, and he would check into it. Uh, and Jeremy, um, in review, told me that to his knowledge, the um, the installation of that yard hydrant did it include a um, backflow preventer, which mm -hmm. would uh, isolate the, the water from uh, contamination. So the pieces as they are there um, work. The store itself is built on a slab. It would not be easy either to fit a hand wash station or 
a curb sink, janitor sink, utility sink, whatever form it might take, the, the sink that would, you would use for larger cleaning projects. Mm -hmm. um, at present, it would not be easy to fit it in or to put it in. Um, Jeremy pointed out uh, when I was musing about the possible cost of plumbing that the sewer connection especially is going to be expensive. But it was always part of his vision for where the store would be heading um, sooner or later. Um, and one thing that we did talk about and uh, agreed was that with our recognizing um, the need for these two sinks, that in the future, um, there may be opportunities for a farm improvement grant or a similar item. Simple Gifts did get one a few years ago that um, brought a new freestanding exterior walk-in cooler mm -hmm. to the store. Um, and that kind of proposal that incorporated um, you know, funds to help the store elevate itself to you know, full compliance with the sinks could be an attractive proposition in the future. So what we can do in inspections is flag the property so that anytime, um, and this was not available to us in 2017, everybody has had to kind of keep in mind that, oh, yes, next time Simple Gifts does something, let's try and get those sinks. We can literally flag the permitting software to remind us that we will see if we can incorporate that with the source cooper with the farms cooperation um, into future proposals. Certainly if any expansion of the store happened, mm -hmm. it would happen then. But you know, even a project like the outdoor cooler or something, you know, else could be a uh, a time when that could happen. So my finding is that at present the compromise solution should continue, that it would be a considerable financial hardship for the the farm at this time in its present um, uh, business state, you know, to take on a project that, you know, would be tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, that we've had no complaints, we've had no, um, you know, noted issues, mm -hmm. you know, so, and the present system, when when we check it, it's, it's being uh, maintained. And I think that that's where we should stay for the moment. And I did include a, a map, one of the documents that gives you relative, you know, distances, the uh, uh, the farm store on North Pleasant Street, the portable hand wash station is just steps, five steps outside the front door, you have to go around a corner. Mm -hmm. um, and the yard hydrant is just a few steps beyond that. The barn is a bit of a hike, but, you know, practically speaking, in most cases, they're set with those two the yard hydrant and the portable station in front. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been thinking about this over the months, and um, and I, I I kind of was thinking about the operation. It, it it the in general, it has these time temperature uh, control for safety foods, and that's kind of what gets it into being a food operation, but. The only way they're being handled is like like a store clerk putting them on the shelf and someone you know checking the person out. They're not being opened or touched or processed or anything else. So it it struck me that the the risks involved were small. And you know I was even wondering if a of a, a variance would be required. But it seems like you um, have figured that out. <laughs> well, I I would say that you know sort staff are handling um, fresh produce mm -hmm. um, and they're, you know, hand washing should be something where they start the day and mm -hmm. they, you know, um, wash whenever um, appropriate during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, for cleaning operations, they can um, mop the store, um, you know, disposal is basically to disperse it on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, I don't think that they're using anything that causes concern about disposal. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very mild form of gray water. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, Jeremy is in attendance if um, you have questions or you know if he has some comments about operations, um, I'm sure he'll speak to those. Um, I don't see any hands raised, but um, I think if this he's agreement is done, oh, okay. So hi, thanks, thanks, Ed, for that summary. I, I don't, I, I think you summarized the situation pretty well. I just thought it was it was appropriate that I say something. Um, but yeah, you've set, summarized the situation pretty well. I guess the one little thing that I would add was that um, there is a def a, a difference in definition between um, there's a zoning definition of farm stand that we used when we made our application, um, which is. 25% uh, of the produce has to be produced on on site in order to be considered a farm stand. And that um, gives gives the permitting some, um, well, I guess I guess it, it allows us to build a build a structure where the zoning might not otherwise allow it. And that that's always been the definition of farm stand that that we've used. Um, and this other definition from the health code um, really, you know, I, I only heard about it when Susan uh, sent that paperwork around with the, um, you know, with with that legislation or that 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 regulation. Um, so that that may be part of where that initial confusion came from. Mm. But it seems like we've worked things out to go ahead as is for unless uh the major uh renovations or changes in the in the farm or farm stand uh come up so i'm happy to hear that we support our local <laughs> want to support our local farmers and have nice fresh organic food in north amherst so uh <clears throat> well thank thank you guys yeah I mean, I... okay so we'll We'll continue and monitor and maintain and work mm -hmm. with Jeremy. Um, and I will put a, a note in our inspections um, file for the property to bring it up as a discussion point at any point that um, improvements are proposed. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? So uh, just have a quick question. Um, I know we are going going with as whatever we are doing, you know, we are not going to add more uh, requirements. So I'm just curious if there is any um, temporary uh, ways of hand washing or even, you know, mopping the floors or anything, you know? Are there any temporary ways, you know, so you can use the bond water to mop or whatever it is? You know? So is there something being used or we don't have any cleaning well, options? The, no, cleaning is, is definitely done. It's done you, rather than, um, say, filling a mop bucket in a curb sink, a janitor sink, you know, by running hot water in from the tap, um, cool water from the yard hydrant has to be heated in a kettle and added to the mop water to assist, you know, to raise that to a temperature where cleaning is more effective. And the same with the hand washing. But the, the water available in the yard hydrant is potable water. Um, and it's it's close at hand. It's as, it's as close as many custodial closets would be in a facility. Um, it does involve going outside, but um, I don't think farmers mind. We, we were looking, when Susan raised these points, she was looking to um, 
raise the the installed you know facilities to mm -hmm. the point um that would have been best specified mm -hmm. in the beginning mm -hmm. so it's yeah. you know after discussion and after reviewing the situation it's not an easy time to do that it would be a hardship mm -hmm. okay I just um, had a question of the installing a permanent sink would require plumbing, which is what raises the cost. But are there like um, sinks that wouldn't require like the heating of the water that would do that automatically? Or I, I just had that question, not to. It, I mean, this could be, you know, if and when it, it happens, this could be a place where a tankless hot water heater would just heat water as it was needed. Um, the problem with those in a hand wash sink is that, and m most of us have experienced this in, in a home, um, you have to wait for the water. Um, and when you're busy, it's hard to wait. You want to just charge ahead, and, you know, get back to the person who's waiting at the counter or whatever. So, but, but that could be simpler than putting in a big hot water tank or some size of hot water tank appropriate for the uses. Um, the water line that comes to the yard hydrant could be extended into the store. You'd have to bring it under the, the slab that the store is built on. It's not, it does not have a, a basement. So you would come under the slab, drill through the slab and bring the piping up into the store. Um, this, if there's an expansion of the store, that would be the ideal time to plant it in because you install those pipes, you cast your slab over those pipes, and then you continue them to the finished fixtures inside. Um, you know, a comprehensive plan might well include a bathroom for workers, um, you know, whatever kind of sinks the business plan might call for if you were processing vegetables there you might want prep sinks if you're doing anything that involved cleaning um, um, various kitchen wares large and small pots or whatever you would be looking at a three bay sink um, you know some you know from small to large it, you, you would size something for the business plan so right now you know cost of plumbing would be considerable because it's not just bringing the water in, it's getting rid of the wastewater. Mm -hmm. And I was I was overlooking that for a minute, but it would require a connection to the sewer um, out on North Pleasant Street. So the water's close already, but the sewer connection is not, not there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, we also would probably want to build a little insulated outbuilding with its own slab um, in order to put a hand wash sink because there, there's really not space in the in the store as it exists now for to put a hand washing sink in there and and that would help us get around the the problem of drilling through the slab as if we but still so it would be a whole a whole little insulated outbuilding we'd have to build in order to in order to put a sink in it wouldn't it wouldn't just be putting in a sink mm -hmm. but if we're building something else you know at that point it's you know, a, a smaller, a smaller part of the project to, to just put in a sink when we've already got, we're already putting plumbing in. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think the access to water is there uh, in the barn. And I think that's reasonable. If there is any need, I think, we could use that one you know, for cleaning or water washing us. Okay, so we'll just uh, hope things continue along the way they have been without incident and problems and, and hope that if uh, the farm gets some uh, has some new plans. They'll they'll get to update, upgrade those facilities um, with some guidance from both the building and the health health department and health inspectors. So, thank you all. Okay.
Thank you. Um, so um, our next item on the agenda is back to the toxic chemical regulations. And I have to say, I appreciated some of the things that Lauren sent my way and looked at them. Um, I didn't see anyone send any regulations from other towns or anything, though, that they found. I wondered if people had looked at that um, and had any thoughts about where, where we're going with this. Um, I know uh, Kyle mentioned and that Nancy Schroeder um, compiled some sort of a list of uh, resources. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of them which are more on uh, pesticide regulations mm -hmm. um, from Marblehead and, uh, and even in Northampton, I think. So these mm -hmm. are pesticide regulations related to um, public use, but one thing I'm 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 um, I observe is we discussed this couple of year, you know the past you know mm -hmm. years that we don't use many pesticides you know so even the roundup you know we had that question and our public uh, off you know spaces don't use roundup uh, if not very occasionally they had some use in uh, poison ivies and stuff like that so. Um, so those are the you know um, resources which are available, um, and I think Nancy was compiling that, and um, and then there is a um, few others on the OSHA.gov. There's I think Kyle sent me on his way uh, on this way, and then also on CDC. Um, so one approach is to actually. Um, augment the compilation which I have um, in the in that uh, report. It's not a report, it's the revision of the potential bylaw into a, a guideline and a, and a type of a resource compilation. Um, we could add all these uh, sources that people can actually use to mitigate or minimize some of the uses, you know. Yeah, I guess I looked at um, Northampton does have a regulation limiting um, glyphosate or Roundup. Um, but again, I think it's used by the city itself. And when uh, I think before either Premal or Lauren was on the board, Tim and I are old hands at this now. Uh, we did have several presentations about that and looked into it and then her, discussed it with um, the director of uh, public works and they looked to see how much of the substance that they had used and I think it was a little bit every couple of years only directed at really resistant patches of poison ivy that were um the kids could get into maybe like you know in the edges of Grove Park or or something where they were at kind of a, a significant risk to you know to people and um and it was extremely limited and it it seemed that a regulation for something like that would have exceptions for urgent actions and was no point in making that kind of regulation i th think we also looked a little bit into the mosquito control on our own it was before joining the pioneer valley mosquito control whatever it is um, and even if we as a town sort of said, no, we're not going to, to, uh, to spray insecticides or larvicides or whatever, but, you know, if the, um, there was a public health emergency, the state would do it anyway. And, and I think, and the state doesn't do it unless there's a public health emergency. So it just seemed like that was a regulation that wasn't needed and so 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 it's not like we've not looked at some of these things but it has hasn't it's been hard for me to find things that 
we could have a list of things that would be not allowed that was reasonable and a way of monitoring it and regulating it. And, and so I haven't seen that kind of thing anywhere, but I could be naive. Um, I think, so then yeah, I think the idea of, of, you know, where, where, where the, where the health department wants to go with this, I don't know, we're going to have a new director, but if a, a, a program to educate, people about what they buy and what they what they put on their lawn and what they put on their bodies and and feed their children and whatever you know could be a, an important um aspect of the public health but i don't know that the regulation is the way to get at that so i i'm happy to think about it in other ways so the northampton uh, report is not a it's not a regulation it's a report mm -hmm. uh, it's a pesticide report which was uh, primarily uh, uh, sent to the Northampton City Council mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's a regulation um, okay. uh, the I think one of the thing we have to consider is um, so here we're focusing on any type of a uh, incentives for not using pesticides or toxic chemicals in public spaces. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, things we know is primarily, um, I think in previous um, uh, meetings, we had uh, procurement department come in. Uh, we also had previously the, uh, about glyphosate discussions that was maybe more than two years ago. Mm -hmm. All these were essentially saying they were very cautious, uh, avoiding any type of toxic chemicals um, and regulating them when there is no issue. I think that is, you know, it becomes redundant you know, in terms of developing it. But in a larger, um, uh, in, a, in a longer viewpoint is, is primarily uh, developing information is actually a really good policy in terms of uh, environmental mitigation. So what I mean by policy is education as a policy, you know, and providing some sort of accessible information um, and also um, the information should have some sort of potential toxic impacts and what type of uh, approaches people can uh, take in terms of mitigating use of them or alternate substances which can actually uh, avoid use of those toxic chemicals. So if, if I mean, that is a really long-term perspective of uh, uh, empowering our communities in terms of uh, this toxic chemical exposure, exposure rather than um, regulating and creating bylaws and which really uh, there is no, I think the public health, we don't have any monitoring. We can't monitor. We don't have, you know, ways of... Uh, going and testing everywhere <laughs> and and even enforcing it you know that becomes a very difficult you know at a micro level yeah i it, one of the things lauren sent that can link to what massachusetts is doing on water supplies and you probably know more about this tim than i do but um they are now measuring like six different um chemicals of the pfos group and uh, they had results from each town for from public water supply. Uh, and I guess currently the Amherst public water supply seems to be testing predominantly okay. There are a few positive, low positive tests scattered in the in the in the results, but it really is not a consistent pattern. Um, but it's kind of good to know that those are being tested and uh, monitored. I think private wells often are bigger risk for, for some of these things. And it depends on where you live and what chemical company you might live next door to or, or uh, airport or uh, where, what the, uh, what the environment, you know, your, the local environment is. Yeah, so for public water supplies, it's required by law that they provide information on water quality and also mitigate any type of source pollution in you know, the contamination. Um, so, um, and PFAS, 
and P4, PFOAs or some sort of an emerging uh, area of discussion. You know, they're very a little bit more complex because they're already everywhere in air, soil, water, everywhere. And then uh, um, it has been used for maybe many, many years. And uh, the discussion is coming at the federal level and the state level on how to handle it. And now I think EPA is recognizing those as very critical and they're de developing some sort of a regulations at a much more federal level. And that has a much more, I would say, a teeth in terms of uh, what type of approaches. Uh, and uh, EPA is also uh, uh, focusing on education as a very key component, but also a lot of research, science behind it, just understanding the toxicity and what what it could be alternate alternate type of uh, uh, materials um, and also uh, um, regulation at more on the production level. So if it's going to be a fire retard and retarding chemical, uh, how to mitigate it you know at, at you know, in the production level or in the use levels. So there's much more larger effort which is being planned at the federal level and the state level. and I, I think you know, um uh i mean they're good you know we, we are in a good direction moving forward they have a lot of uh, information and resources and science behind it coming up there's a lot of investment uh, at umass water center in research towards pfas um uh, so th those are very good news you know happening in that area um i just want to add um it seems like there's the more you look up information, the more it does get complex. But um, I saw an article that was talking about um, a new water treatment plant in Littleton, um, Massachusetts, um, and how much it costs to um, put in a new water filtration plan um, for PFAS, and PFAS is a toxic, I didn't know it was a toxic chemical, but it's considered a toxic chemical. So if we are looking at toxic chemicals and in, including PFAS, um, I think we need to continue the conversation because um, there's also the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, which you know, focuses on our, our state and um, PFAS, they, they, from my reading, they are researching the six um, PFAS chemicals because of their links to cancer. It said elevated cholesterol um, and changes in um, immunity. And so um, I think it's important to to really like, instead of us like trying to say that it's their state and federal regulations, I I don't quite understand that argument because where we can still do something at the local level, which I think we should be focusing on. And um, I in the article about Littleton, Massachusetts, it. Um, quoted um, a water industry advocate, Jennifer Peterson, that said that drinking water only accounts for 20% of the public's exposure to PFAS, and the other 80% is in our food, our packaging, consumer products, which I assume would be like the skincare products or the cleaning products. And so I'm still not sure like what the board is really trying to say, or what, Tim? What, what, what the, what your, what your argument? I don't understand what your argument is, um, because oh, def yeah, I, 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 I definitely think that there is. We need to narrow down what we are are actually trying to, either regulate or advise, because there, from my understanding, there is from the EPA, from the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, there are health advisories. And if we just wanna focus on PFAS because the other chemicals we don't really use or cannot regulate, then 
that that would be fine. I just think that that we need to understand what we're trying to focus on. So let me clarify, you know, we are not saying they are not important. So if you look at the document we wrote, uh, it's actually highlighting the toxicity, it's highlighting everything. Uh, it's a it's a it's it's a recognition of the board that uh, these are all extremely important. And, and our approach is actually saying, um, uh, we need to actually take this information to the communities as, as an educational awareness. And, uh, and that's, that's the argument here, you know. So, so we have a list of all those contaminants. I, I don't know if, if you remember from the mm -hmm. previous write-up, we had uh, uh, pesticides, we had uh, uh, PFAS, and we also documented from literature how they are very important in understanding public health and everything. So that is there. I think I wanted to actually bring that one to the public as, 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 a, uh, as a very important uh, recognition by the board and request in terms of having, here are all the alternatives, here are all the uh, approaches you can actually mitigate them in terms of exposure, usage, and, and, and also improve their own public health at a much more um, uh, individual level in terms of empowering themselves in what they use and what they don't use. And that's what I, I think I'm, I'm thinking uh, our, uh, our information we are actually providing to our community is having all this information which Lauren mentioned, but in addition to that, what are some of the uh, ways we could actually mitigate? I don't know if, if I'm clarifying that. I, I guess what I have trouble with is that there are a lot of things that have these chemicals in it. Some of them we know about and some of them we don't. Um, like we knew, you know what, I, there's certain things like the plastic bags are a problem, right? It was, it was possible to say, okay, stores can't use single use plastic bags because they're an environmental problem. And you could use paper bags or bring your own bags. You had an, uh, and you could regulate that. But if you couldn't really tell a store not to sell anything in a plastic that's in a plastic bottle or that's wrapped in plastic or, you know, I, I just don't know how how we can put a regulation around all this information or, you know, if if you'd have a list of things that the town shouldn't buy X, Y or Z or in this kind of package, you know, first of all, we don't know all the ones that are a problem and the ones that aren't. And then also, it's just, it's just not, I, I don't know, it's just too, too much. And, and I think it has to come somehow in a different way. I, I don't, I, I, I just don't see how we could have a regulation that says this, we can't use PFAS. That would in, exclude like, so many products and not even because the product has it in it, but maybe the packaging has it in it. Um, and, and we don't even actually know um, what's in what. And the fact that um, although they're measuring these six more prominent PFAS, PFAS kind of chemicals, there are thousands of them and some of them may not be as bad. Some of them might be just as bad. So, it's like Tim said, it's kind of we're at the beginning of of figuring this out and it it's too uh, too unwieldy to regulate at a uh, town level. I mean, the, the the government could say you can't use these things in manufacturing, you know, because that's where all this stuff starts. Um, but we can't really do that. Um, so that that's where I got stuck. I, I was I've been around and around on this, and I'm trying to figure out what what's doable. And I just couldn't figure out anything that is doable by a town regulation. Right, but, but before I mean, the last meeting we discussed regulation versus guidelines versus public education and even if you had a public education, you know, resource, you, the public has a choice of what they, they purchase. 
But like, for example, when you go into Walmart, they don't even have bags anymore. You just take your, your whatever you buy and you go where you bring your own bags. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I'm not really sure what, what a public education would do if, again, if this is about choice, we don't, we, we can choose to buy products however we want, but it's, it, it's involved, yes, education, but also, um, from my understanding, the, the different agencies are trying to put regulation and, and advisory. So it's, to me, it just seems that we should have more of a focus than just saying that these other higher levels of government are going to do whatever they're doing. And then we follow suit. I, I, I just, to me, I just don't see what the point of of, of that thinking is. I, I just don't. Well, I, I would welcome, you know, something that if, if you could find or come up with something that would would work as a regulation and that would be practical you know, um, enforceable, um, you know, I haven't had the imagination <laughs> to figure something like that out. Um, and I, I'm not against the idea of regulations, but I, I'm not sure how to do it. I, I kind of looked, California is kind of ahead of the curve on testing products and um, I, I, they're, and looking at products and what's in them. And I didn't know if they might have a list of things that are, you know, I, I don't know. I just wonder, I wondered if de delving into some of the things their Environmental Protection Agency is doing might be helpful as a, you know, to point out things that might be could be regulated. I I don't know. I think there are a lot of things that are. If you buy something, it says on it, "This is like you no know, California says this is a toxic product or something." I, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and should be. I don't even re remember what it fin what it says, but it does say that that it's been identified as some somehow problematic in, by the state of California. Um, but Again, I, uh, it's, that's a state state regulations. It is. It is. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, we have to recognize that it's a the, the markets are like like we don't produce everything we consume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If that is so, we can actually have some good regulation on who is producing what and everything, but that's not the case in much of the markets. Products are coming from else, elsewhere, you know, not from mm -hmm. Amherst. So in those cases, uh, empowering the consumers on being informed and what, they, what their choices are, and uh, I think that's the best way to do that. And But also, there's so many agencies exclusively dedicated to this uh, this work. For example, we talked with procurement's office in Massachusetts. Um, so they do like sustainable procurement. And that's our actually uh, focus. And they help a lot of towns in, in, in designing and identifying procurements which are much more sustainable with, um, with minimal impacts. And uh, the, my only question is, what is not covered by them which we will focus on. If we can identify that, then I think it'll be a uh, it'll be a useful time for us to actually develop some sort of a regulations. But I I still haven't seen things which are not covered by uh, other agencies, which the Board of Health has to step in. I think uh, another uh, just just as I say, you know, PFAS is just only one problem. Basically. 
there are nanomaterials coming up microplastics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everywhere you know if you look at microplastics how much we consume plastics these mm -hmm. are very small particles these are microplastics uh, in personal care products the, all the pharmaceuticals we have so these emerging contaminants are actually a huge challenge and um, on how we handle it and so in my um, i mean you know uh, it, it's coming from very variety of sources on what we purchase and everything. We are not only focusing on one type of a commodity when we go to mall, mart, everything. So when we buy makeup products, medicines, all this ent enters into water bodies. These are the emerging contaminants. And, and I think uh, informing the public and also uh, having some sort of informed decision making uh, in, 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 I think it's it's a right way as a policy because it empowers student, it empowers families and communities in terms of their choices of purchases and what they are exposing themselves to. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of efforts, mechanisms in terms of trying to handle this at a different scales. So. Mm -hmm. One thing we can do, you know, we're going to have a new health director soon. It might be nice to have a conversation with her about about her thoughts about what the department can do. Um, you know, you know, the from my understanding, the department does more programming and education and publicizing, and we do more regulating, <laughs> and it's kind of frustrating sometimes, but. Um, but we do have to somewhat different different roles in this in uh, helping to improve the public health. But education could also be a sort of regulation. <laughs> could, I'm just saying, you know, we, we have to produce these types of brochures, having some sort of a, we, we, for smoking, we provide some sort of a labels mm -hmm. uh, or information brochures. Mm -hmm. So we had used that money during the, even during the uh, pandemic, we had been informing. So we had a delegates, a contingent of delegates going and teaching. And that's, mm -hmm. we can say that is a, that's even a, uh, we could make it into a regulation, you know, if you want to saying we need this type of educational programming as a part of our budget. Mm. Uh, I was just going to add, because water is so essential, where, um, I, I kind of lost what I sent you, but in Amherst, where would we get the information for, um, you said they were testing the water in Amherst, would um, Smith, Mr. Smith have that information or is there a yes. website or like how do, we even find out what what the water quality is for Amherst. Um, can I answer that? Yeah. So um, every um, household in Amherst, they get monthly water quality reports. Mm -hmm. It's very detailed. Um, so uh, it usually comes in as an attachment to the bill or receipts, you know, so everyone Primarily, about informed and but it's extremely detailed. Um, every type of a specific contaminant and what is their uh, goal, uh, what are the limits? If there is any exceedance of those limits, uh, what type of uh, uh, response the Public Works Department is doing in terms of uh, just like in Springfield, we had uh, a water advisory that means for boiling because it might be some sort of exceedance for E. coli. Uh, or any type of contaminants of concern. So that's a detailed report, monthly report coming in. I believe that that report is also available as a PDF on the Public Works Department website. Anyone can access it. And I did see the PFAS uh, results on, on the Massachusetts website. Um, and it, 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 it listed by town and it actually listed it by each different water source in the town like the wells and the reservoir and 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 over time it, it showed all of that data 
Um, and I don't remember if that was limited to PFAS or if it was more of a, if I found that in a general report, but, but those, that data is out there. I think between the town site and the state, it's, um, that information is available. And that's the information I'm thinking we could provide to our town, you know, so because right now we have to search in a state website or anything, but if we can have everything handy on what 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 those contaminant status are and what what uh, what type of options people have and and I think that's what I mean by a resource page you know so having a very interactive type of a place where they can actually see what's happening in the town you know so mm -hmm. I, I would support, I like the idea of regulating um, some type of educational program along with the resource page. Um, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I don't know that we can do that or not. <laughs> um, I don't know if we can mandate the uh health department to do that kind of thing to be honest but uh that's something to look into we could uh, make a suggestion to the new director yeah. saying that there might be some sort of a brochures we could develop using some sort of a help from i don't know where where the help from comes from students or whatever it is and then distribute them in some public places where people can actually read them and see what's happening to their waters soils and different contaminants and but that's one possibility i think the way people get information is so tricky <laughs> that I, we need a little something sophisticated to kind of get it out where people can actually use it um having spent many years trying to get information out to college students <laughs> it it it, that they actually pay attention to and now we have like and that's just one narrow segment of a population versus like a whole town where where there's a very diverse uh group of age wise uh and otherwise that to kind of make that's a sophisticated thing is to get information to people but uh, i think you should try um and so we need uh, increased budget for our public health yes. department. Yes. Having some dedicated staff doing that, you know, education and type of things. So. Well, yeah, the way, you know, to think about how the different departments work together in town too and, and kind of disseminating things uh, is another way to look. But that would be education, right? Not not regulation. And I'm right. I'm sort of wondering, you know, if that is beyond the scope of the board, um, mm -hmm. you know, making regulations unless um, unless there's some kind of public health issue. <clears throat> excuse me, that requires us to, or something is brought to us. Um, I'm just, you know, I'm a little confused because the board was asked to comment on the use of PFAS and, uh, you know, it, but that's, that's just it. You're not, we're not regulating anything. Right. I mean, I, I, I get what Tim says that there's still a lot of information and, um, you know, people are at, they're looking at it at the state level, but I'm, I'm just wondering sort of, I guess the bottom line is I'm wondering where we're going with this. Well, PFAS is a toxin. So if we're discussing toxin, um, toxic regulation, but then we are thinking of reducing that conversation to a guideline, then PFAS should be included in the conversation and we should have a focus on how we are li limiting PFAS in um, the public consumption and you know helping to educate the public that is what i would think mm. yeah no i i agree with you i'm just saying that's education though that's not regulation mm -hmm. yes we we already we already said that we 
would not be able to necessarily regulate, but whatever, if we need to go back to what the actual regulation was, the toxic, toxic, because there was a toxic regulation that we look that was on the Amherst books that we were supposed to revise or update. Mm -hmm. And if, if PFAS is a toxin and there's other other toxins that may be unknown or as you said might be upcoming then i think we should get some more expertise or more research or something to understand where we want to target our education or uh, target the guidelines for for helping you know the town residents to to make more informed decisions, whether it's, you know, how they consume, you know, products or byproducts, or, you know, be more aware of what is in the actual water, um, because that that is still a concern to me. And I do have neighbors who have recently, um, you know, been diagnosed with cancer, um, so, I do know that there there is a concern uh, and a you know there there's definite concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so, think one of the things that came up about the regulation was that it was there on the books for twenty years, but there was no kind of enforcement or people didn't know what to do with it basically it, it um the only thing it did was that people we didn't buy bleached paper i think that was switch that was made and that was all um so it it kind of pointed out the the difficulty with this i think so um i think the the i agree that the old one was started with that uh, acid bleaching of paper, you know, and how do we address it? And then they started to write a regulation, but it was not used in any way for almost 20 years <laughs> uh, because there's no enforcement, there's no teeth to it. And uh, But I, I think uh, following up on Pramila's question is, um, we are not educators, but for example, when we had pandemic, we put a lot of information on the website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that information provision is a very key, key element for our for public health department. And uh, for example, if if anyone in the community can can see, you know, what's going on in the in the community. And I think they should easily access information on um, what should I do with PFAS coming in or what should I do with any type of a uh, uh, roundup or uh, any, any, so that information is some sort of a mm -hmm. uh, missing in the public health department. That's what I'm saying. You know, if if there is any place where people can go and then look at what happened to PFAS studies in Massachusetts, uh, mm -hmm. what are the results, and they can actually get, but also uh, resources on what they can do. And I think that's very mm -hmm. uh, empowering in terms of having those types of. Uh, uh, a compiled information in one place. Yeah, there are some simple things that people can do that will won't eliminate these things, but will help reduce them in their lives. Yeah. You know, in terms of what sort of pan they cook in or what they drink out of. Um, do they heat stuff in the microwave in plastic or you know or that they're just things that in your everyday life might help reduce things a little bit and maybe what kind of um, products you buy, you know, like uh, with especially like cosmetics and, and some of those things that are, are um, there are some that are better than others in terms of fewer issues with toxic chemicals. So, so, so I think it is, it is something we can work with the health department to promote um so I, I think that the story that never ends um but uh i think we can try to work you know speak with our new health director and see mm -hmm. where we go from here 
And we, any other things before we go to the next topic? I I, I think uh, um, the next step is uh, Kyle and, uh, and I think the staff member in the yes. health department, they are actually, Nancy Schroeder, they are actually working on compilation so they can continue. But I think when the new director comes in, um, they we can reevaluate and see you know how we can move forward. So okay. And is there anyone we could invite to that would know more about this, or that we could invite to talk to the board, talk to us about it? I would say I don't know of a person fits that description you mean uh, who will what type of expertise are you thinking mm -hmm. um well we keep questioning is there other towns that are doing some type of toxic regulation what type of toxins how do we regulate those toxins what you know is there someone that I I could try reaching out to the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards to see if they have any anything to say. Okay. That they probably have an overview of of they help with regulations. I, and um, so I, I will do that. I'll write to them. Um So to be continued. <laughs> so our next old business item is the body art establishment regulation. It turns out it's a little more complicated to set up a hearing and um, Kyle informed me that it's in the works, but it won't be until November. You have to, I have to put it in, um, in the newspaper and publicize it. And there are just all these steps that need to happen. So that will be in the November meeting at, at the beginning of the November meeting. Um, I don't know if we want it. I, I think we can wait, you know, we'll, we'll have to, We I think we, I put the date in of starting the regulation as November 1st. I think once we have the hearing, we can then set a date for, mm -hmm. uh, if we pass it, when it would go into effect, and also at that time maybe set those fees. I wrote to Stephen McCarthy. I forget his if that's his right name, who was in um, licensing to ask about um, if there are any guidelines regarding fee setting because I think uh, because Jennifer Brown had mentioned his name to me, um, but haven't I did that a couple of days ago? Haven't yet heard back. Um, I, I think we could just wing it, you know, you know, with basically Tim's idea for the monthly one is like approximately one twelfth or around there. And, and just, um, the, the, uh, apprentice one is a lower value than the full, full one. But if we get some more information, we can use that. And as we do that, any other com, uh, comments or concerns about body art? No. We, we could um, we could actually vote on the same day mm -hmm. after we have a public hearing. Right. So I think we could, you know, if you want to move forward quickly, you know, we can do that. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the November, November meeting when or October meeting, uh, um, if if we have a public hearing, Mm -hmm. At the end of that, we could actually the 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 board can vote on that, you know. So right, yeah, I think we can be be ready to vote on. I'd like to be ready yeah. to vote on that as soon as we have the hearing, unless something comes up that we need to make some changes based on the hearing. Um. All right, and the last the last item is the board of health chair. It's also continuing discussion. Um, basically it was just uh, me, Lauren and Tim last month. So we didn't really decide anything. Um, you know, I, I think Tim had brought a point that suggested that 
I'll get, get back to, I'll start over. <laughs> We're discussing whether to have a, a chairperson or a co have a co-chairs. Um, and I think Tim made a point that it's probably better for communication to have just a chairperson. And that person works with the director to come up with the agenda for the next meeting primarily, and then runs that and runs that meeting. Um, uh, the in what's involved in setting up the agenda is around two weeks before the meeting. Um, the I, I've been talking with Kyle as a uh, as a representative of the health department to say. Uh, you know, if there are any topics that have come up from the health department end, and I have looked at the previous minutes and gone back also to pre prior months, even to see if there were any loose ends, um, and to come up with items for the that meeting. About again, that was about two weeks before the the next meeting and then that gets finalized about one week before and it's published um and it, he reaches out to add uh, the inspectors and and to see if there are items that are coming from that direction and then a few days before the meeting he reaches out to the inspectors again to come up with um any additions to the meeting so it's not that complicated um and my sense is anyone who wants to bring forward a member of the board uh, a, a topic can bring that to the chair and get it on you know on the on the agenda. I mean, it, just try to balance it so it's not a, a you know an agenda that's ten miles long, but um, but you know something that things that we can do progressively. So. My thought was, and I like comments on this, is that we might want to vote on whether we have a chairperson or co-chairs first, and then vote on uh, on the actual person who, who who will be person or people who will be the chair or co-chairs. Is that process? How does that process sound? Yeah, I I think that would be a good uh, good strategy to actually vote on those two stages. Mm -hmm. But I would I would wait till the new director comes in. You know, next I think the director is going to start next month. Yes. So uh, and then we'll be having new board members. And one more board. I thought we'd have yeah. everybody this month, honestly. <laughs> yeah. So I think that'll be a reasonable. You know, like a. a uh, meeting where we could actually decide on those two things, in my opinion, okay. not today. So. so I will continue as the <laughs> acting chairperson. Yes. But I have to say, I think I have to tag someone else to do next month's meeting because I'm going to be, I'll, I'm going to be in Portugal for several weeks coming up when that process of setting up the uh, agenda is happening. I will probably actually be here for the meeting, but someone if someone else could step forward to be the acting chair that would be great so this will be october what date are like is it like 11th october 10th? 12th it's october 12th mm. Uh, can I, I just want to pedal back and say, I listened to uh, the recording of the meeting um, that I didn't attend last month. Mm -hmm. And and I agree that it, it makes sense to do a chair and a vice chair mm -hmm. uh, just for ease of communication and clarity, a rotating uh, uh, chairperson does not seem to me to be optimal, just mm -hmm. it paves the way for for uh, confusion, I think. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's all I wanna say about that. Yeah, I guess the question is, do we need the vice chair actually, or co-chair that, or not? And that, that, 
that was also a question. <laughs> well, who was the, was there a vice chair or co-chair when Nancy was the chair? No. Oh. Okay. No, that would be an additional person. So it's something so, that, uh, you know, I, I guess because I brought up this issue that yeah. I wasn't clear, I wanted You're to be yeah. for the whole year and it's going to be a tricky period of time for me. That came up I see. as I've gone along. And then as Tim kind of was made a convincing argument <laughs> that it might be better to just keep it as one person and then pass it off when it needs to be passed off. Um, so, which isn't maybe as often as I anticipated, but think about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for, so for next month, if you want me to, you know, just, um, uh, help you on, on your, during your absence, I could do that. Too. Okay. So I'll, that's what I'm, I'm thinking, you know, so you, you can actually, uh, if the chair is actually going away somewhere and they need someone from the board to actually step in. You can mm -hmm. send out a general email and see someone who is uh, volunteering can step mm -hmm. in. So, right. right. This one I know in advance. So I thought I'd bring it up here. Yeah. Uh, and what I would do then is have Kyle get in, or I, I don't know who it'll be, Kyle or the new director get in touch with you, Tim, if you're willing to do that. Sure. Uh, and we will we will not be voting next uh, next month, is right for the whether we want to do a chair or a co-chair or something, and who will be the chair? Because you right. won't be there. No, I will be. I think I'll be. Oh, at you'll the be. Meeting. Oh, I'm you'll be in the meeting. Okay. until the October seventh or eighth, and then back but there's that window of time where this ah, okay. gets set it's more of that, that, yeah. that piece i will be there sure i think i'm i won't be in amherst but i'll be in this in in this time zone uh, so. sounds good yeah i was also going to ask um can someone from the health department be run the meeting or be a vice chair I think that's up to the board, honestly. I mean, I think the board is responsible for that. No, well, the well, the new health director, they will be at the meetings, like yes. um, Jennifer. Like and Jennifer, yeah. And, and it's possible for them to be a vice chair? I don't think so, because they're not a member of the board. They're an employee of the health department. Okay. Yeah. But the it it's actually the the whoever is on the health the board works with the the health department to set the agenda. There's a there's a conversation or, or email back and forth um, about about those things. So all right and. Any other questions about that or anything else? No. So we have to appreciate Tim for being the co-host of and hosting, be doing the technical aspect of this meeting tonight because Kyle had a conflict uh, and I didn't want to try to do that. It, I feel like nothing came up, but no technical difficulties. But if they did, I would totally be flustered. So I appreciate the fact that he take, took that role. Um, and so do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I can make a motion to adjourn our meeting. It's and I'll second. Uh, Pramila? I'll uh, second, yeah. Okay. Um, are we going to vote? Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. And and Lauren. Yes. Yeah. And Tim. Aye. And Maureen. Aye. And our next meeting is October twelfth. Thank you. Right. Thank you, everyone. All right. Good night. Good night.